Thank you very much, really, for the kind invitation to the EMA session, special mm -hmm. session always. My data are soft data compared to the data John just showed. And he tells, says of some of his data that these data are soft data. You can imagine what mine are. So we are living in an aging world. Very soon we will have one billion individuals on our Earth. At the age of 50 years, female life expectancy will be about 30 years. Therefore, menopause will be a main issue of public health care. Prevention and treatment will be mandatory. And the maintenance of quality of life in the elderly will be essential so that they can stay independent for as long as possible. We have several definitions of health-related quality of life. I choose the one from Spilke and Revicki. They define it as health-related quality of life represents those parts of quality of life that directly relate to an individual's health, and it includes domains of physical, psychological, social, spiritual, and role functioning, as well as general well-being, a very global definition. Health-related quality of life after menopause depends on many facts. We have general health and lifestyle, the physical functioning, integrity, mental health, and what is interesting and important, mental health before menopause has a role. Then psychological, emotional stability before menopause, a positive partnership, including satisfactory sexual life, the education the patient had, professional activity, religion, cultural environment, social integration before menopause. So that shows you already why I have said at the beginning we have quite soft data because it's difficult to control for all these factors. And then we have the cultural impact as it is shown by this example. There are many publications like this one. Here we have Japan, Canada, and the U.S. in comparison for lack of energy, irritability, and feeling depressed. Japan evidently is a special case. Lack of energy is rare, irritability is rare, and feeling depressed is rare. What is most astonishing for me is the difference between Canada and the USA, probably linked to a completely different ethnical uh, distribution and because some of the data is coming from the Swan study by special selection of the population studied. What is the effect of menopause and quality of life? We have the vasomotor component, the psychosocial component, the physical and the sexual component. In blue you have the premenopause, then green the perimenopause, then five years, uh, less than five years after menopause in yellow and more than five years in red. What we can see from this slide is that before menopause, all these symptoms may already be present. But if you look at intensity, it is significantly less than uh, from the perimenopause to the later postmenopause, not the really late, but the later postmenopause. Then we have another aspect. We have the self-reported quality of life here 12 months after menopause from Sweden. Here we have negative mood, memory problems, joint pain, vitality, and lateral dryness. If you have a negative attitude against menopause, all is very black and negative in that case. You have a decrease of your mood. You have memory problems that are relevant, you have joint pains that may disturb you, and your vitality is going down. What is interesting, if you are neutral, it is not so different for many aspects as you have negative. For instance, vitality is more or less as much reduced as for a negative attitude. There are some differences if you are neutral for the memory problems, they are like the positive population, and here for joint pain, they are nearly inexistent, this population. So how you feel yourself, how you uh, think that menopause is, or attitude has an important role in defining quality of life. Let us pass now to depressive symptoms and quality of life. There is an impact of depression on quality of life. We know from a lot of studies that in depressive patients, quality of life is by definition decreased. But there is an association too between somatic symptoms and depression. 
On this slide, you can uh, read what happens after depression in function, after menopause, I'm sorry, in function of your mood. When you are depressed in red, all the symptoms are more severe. Why that is, if there's a common link behind in the brain, I think might be, but you don't have the proofs. But there was no correlation to the menopausal state. Inversely, if you look at current uses of estrogen compared to never use of estrogen, the current users have much, uh, a much lower risk to become depressive. So estrogens seem to protect from depression, at least in many women, not in all of these women. The consequence of depression on medication adherence, I think, is often underestimated. That is a study done in out patients with coronary heart disease. In black, you have the depressed patients. In gray, you have the non-depressed patients. What happens is that the depressed patient do not take their medication as prescribed. They forgot to take it, and sometimes they simply decide not to take it. So depression is a risk for uh, adherence. And depression is a risk for death. Again, that is a heart factor, as John said before. If you look at death after stroke or cardiovascular death or all-cause mortality, you always have a higher risk for depressed patients compared to non-depressed patients. So you have a direct impact from mood on your longevity. Partnership, the same. Women having a low degree of symptoms have usually a better partnership. Women having many symptoms, severe symptoms, have a worse partnership. Uh, they are dissatisfied. And if you look at what happens on sexual satisfaction, here after complete castration uh, through bone marrow transplantation and irritation before, you see that HRT is able to maintain your sexual satisfaction, whereas the women without have a drop, an important drop in satisfaction. And that is, of course, an important factor for quality of life, too. So to treat women having sexual difficulties will have an impact on quality of life. Chronic diseases and quality of life, I think that is a point we in gynecology underestimate. Uh, this slide shows you what happens to health rate quality of life if you have one chronic disease, two chronic diseases, three or four or more. If you go to two, it's still acceptable. There is an impact, but it's very important. Three, quality of life decreases, and with four or more, you have an important drop of quality of life. If you look at individual diseases, here osteoporosis, myocardial infarction, uterine cancer, breast cancer, all these diseases, of course, diminish quality of life. Here you have the current health state, as it is estimated by questionnaire, and you, here you have the estimated quality of life reduction by the disease. Now, the, the reduction is significant for osteoporosis, not significant for the other diseases, probably because the numbers here have been too small. Osteoporosis is a high-risk factor for a reduced quality of life. Women having no fractures have a basic quality of life, as that has been defined in this study. If you, go, if you look only at the age, you have an increase of deduction, a reduction of quality of life, that means a decrease of quality of life. If you have one, two, three, or four fractures, you have a Again, a decrease of quality of life. If you combine both, that is column here, your quality of life is going down highly, in a highly significant way. Inversely, depression increases the risk of falls and therefore the risk of factors. You have here women with uh, just one to two depressive symptoms and this and women having more than 10 depressive symptoms. The difference between the two groups is highly significant. These ladies have much more falls and therefore uh, much more uh, fractures and a higher reduction of quality of life. We don't know, unfortunately, if these women took SSRIs or antidepressants because these substances by themselves alone increase the risk of fall. 
It is similar for the gender-specific quality of life in coronary heart disease. Here, one year after diagnosis, look only at the two red columns. You have here the males and the females. Both have a change in quality of life, but the change for the males is much more important than for the females. And here, similar study done in women after stroke, or let's say half of the population has been women, uh, women with a stroke and a depression, that is this column here, compared to women with a stroke without a depression, have a better quality of life. And here you have the same for anxiety. If you are less anxious, you have a better quality of life than if you're anxious. Diabetes, too, has an impact on quality of life. You have your energy, emotional reactions, social isolation, and physical mobility. For all these factors, the general population has a better quality of life than a population with a type 2 diabetes taking tablets. What is interesting is that the insulin group is in between, probably because the, uh, the, the uh, controls in insulin-treated women are better. How to maintain a good quality of life what can we do? All articles recommend a regular active healthy lifestyle associated with the smallest decline in physical and mental mobility. So be, to be active in any form will improve your physical and mental mobility. There has been the Amsterdam Longitudinal Aging Study finding a beneficial effect of activities, interestingly enough, sports, current as activity, and non-sports too. So you have to do something, but not, it's not said that you have to do sports. Then we have a physical activity in the very old. We know that, that mortality is reduced. That has been significant in this study. Balanced training is very important, again, in the elderly. You have less falls, less fractures, and therefore better quality of life. So whatever you do, you have to stay active mentally and physically and train your equilibrium. Then uh, nutritional interventions may be helpful. Protein supplement supplements are recommended and they have been proven efficient for bone. We think that it might be beneficial for muscular function too, but there the data are weak. And then a study looked at the essential amino acid supplements, and again, there might be some effect, but the proof is not formal. What about hormones? First, we have the estrogens. We have, of course, a significant decrease of other motor symptoms, improving by that already quality of life. We have a better sleep. We have less depression and anxiety, especially in the perimenopause. Then we have bone protection, cardio protection, and we can maintain muscle strength, and we have a decrease in Alzheimer's disease and cognition decrease. So again, all these factors will act positively on health-related quality of life. Just one study showing you uh, that estrogens are active. That is the Wicklund study done in a population having symptoms. And you see that the score in the women with estradiol is significantly better than the score without isodiol. And here you see the factors where the treatment has been the most active, that is anxiety, vitality, self-control, and well-being. And on the other hand, sleep, less social isolation, and a better sexual life. What has been discussed, if you look at other hormones, testosterone, there we have an evidence for an improvement of mood and sexuality in women after ovarectomy but not in intact women. The same for quality of life. It works in women after having been castrated. Then the HEA, there is evidence, but the evidence can be discussed, and it is quite weak. Progesterone is always put forward uh, in the way that it would ameliorate quality of life, but the data are not very solid. Growth hormone, it has been used in frailty, the evidence can be discussed. There is no formal proof that it is really uh, positive. And then some other hormones have been used too in an isolated way. Vitamin D, 
I'm not thinking of calcium bone metabolism, has a good point. We think that, uh, and I have seen in several uh, publications speaking for that, that vitamin D acts at many levels, at the cardiovascular level, that has an activity in cancer, etc. And we know, too, that frailty is a condition frequently associated with low serum vitamin D. So there are many arguments to give and maintain current levels of vitamin D. What can we conclude? Quality of life after menopause is modulated by all these factors we have already mentioned. The most important are written here. One is self-confidence. Point two, climatic symptoms and somatic illnesses negatively influence each other and reduce health related to quality of life. Point three, depressive mood influences negatively somatic illnesses and mortality. And mortality is a hard fact. Therefore, climacteric symptoms, medical illnesses, and depressive mood have to be diagnosed and to be treated in the interest of general health and quality of life. I think that's all we can do to maintain and stimulate good quality of life. And what we aim at is that quality of life remains optimal just some weeks or months before dying, and that we avoid the traditional way that we go slowly down and become dependent. Thank you very much.